Good morning and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we are going to start this uh, morning meeting, which will be recessed um, to an afternoon meeting as well. So um, the first item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, November 25th. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, November 25th without any additions, deletions or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion carried unanimously. <clears throat> uh, the next item on this morning's agenda is the executive director's report. Um, Susan Barrett. Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Wednesday. I just have a couple of comments. A reminder that um, our ACO uh, FY21 One Care budget uh, period, the public comment period, um, is open until December 21st. But as a reminder that we're, we're asking that public comments be submitted by December 2nd, 2020, which is today, um, to be considered for the December 9th presentation. Uh, we will be accepting public comments up until the 21st. In fact, we accept public comments 365 days a year, but wanted to make sure that if folks wanted to have those considered um, within this uh, presentation for December 9th to get those in uh, to our public comment portal. And all of the public comments posted to date are, um, or received to date are posted on our website. And then I also just wanted to mention that yesterday we had our first meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board Prescription Technical Advisory Group. I want to um, thank Christina McLaughlin, who is leading the effort from our team as well as board member Lunge for her expertise in that group. And uh, we met yesterday for a couple of hours. It was a really informative discussion. I'm hopeful that this, uh, this group of experts in pharmaceuticals can help uh, the board and the state address the high cost of prescription drugs. Um, and I don't have anything else to report, Chair Mullen. I'll just send it back to you. Thank you, Susan. So th the next item on the agenda is a, a further discussion on the hospital budget lessons learned, and I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Rooney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, board members, uh, hospital budget stakeholders, and members of the public. Uh, to build on what Kevin had said, we are here to discuss the <clears throat> um, continuance of the hospital budget debrief. And let me know when you can see my screen. We can. Okay, and I apologize for the barking dogs. Those are mine. Um, that may go on for a couple of minutes, just to warn you. So <clears throat> uh, we're here to continue this work um, about a month after our initial meeting in which the stakeholders, that being the board, the Green Mountain Care Board staff, the HCA and VAS got together in a public meeting to discuss the hospital budget processes, opportunities and challenges, et cetera. And then following that, we were asked by the board to <clears throat> uh, kind of digest all that was downloaded from those various parties. So we got five board members, the staff, the HCA, and Boz representing 14 community hospitals. It's a lot of perspectives. Um, there was a lot put forth that day. So we spent a couple of weeks um, building this into a structure that we hope can serve the board um, to make some decisions on how best to move forward. So um, what we are looking at here is a structure that from this, we hope that the board will provide the staff with some guidance on where you want us to begin to spend our energies and our, our resources to improve this process. And that's the approach that we were going for. And what we arrived at <clears throat> was this list here, and we'll go through this as we move through. So what we did was we we bucketed what we heard from everyone into some common themes. We figured the best approach here, because we're all stakeholders in this process, is to try to find some shared interests, common ground, et cetera. So we bucketed pretty broadly some common themes. We then took those and moved them into short-term and long-term considerations, as in what can the board act on now and 
um, what might take some time, third party involvement, research, et cetera, to achieve to return a value to this process. So we've got some items in here that we've tagged in certain areas where things like, for example, the hospital budget guidance, we want to shorten that. That's something the board can pretty much take unilateral action on whenever they so choose. And then there's other items as we'll go through what that could um, take some time to get at. We then decided that we'd try to um, peg these items on an implementation analysis. What's of importance? What really isn't? What is easy to implement? What really isn't? And so on. And we wrap up with some other comments of items that weren't explicitly stated as a common theme across parties, but that we felt should be um, should be built into the process, um, acknowledged or even continued throughout. So saying that, I'll move into some of the common themes. And the three common three themes on the screen on slide three here are discussions around change in charge. We heard um, several parties discuss um, the potential to uh, to arrive at some opportunities there or acknowledge challenges. What's the best measurement of growth? Currently, it's MPR. Are there alternatives that we want to explore? And then transparency in the decision-making process. So those are kind of the big three. And moving through that, there were more detailed matters that were brought up that kind of build into the change in charge discussion. And on slide four here, We've kind of we bucketed what we thought were some of those items. So more specific guidance around the components of change in charge. Uh, for example, does the board want to acknowledge the inflationary factor and have the hospitals show that explicitly when discussing their charge? If you ask for four percent, how much of that is is of inflation is built into that? Does the board want to allow an allotment for cost shift? Does the board want to allow uh, an, an allotment for a margin? Like, what what do we want to go into that? And how explicit do we want to get? Um, that's something that the staff felt we could probably get at sooner rather than later, should the board want to move forward with it. The next one up that we had was uh, the COVID component. Originally, there was some temporary nature to that. It was then made uh, permanent upon reconsideration. So what is it we need to do with that? And um, I believe the HCA had brought up concerns about that becoming permanent. So how do we want to get at that? That's something we will have to address in the short term going into the next guidance process or budget process in general. So therefore, um, what do we, how do we want to approach that, that piece that we built in this year um, to deal with the COVID pandemic? Um, standardizing the measurement, the uh, measurement of change in charge. We, we came across an issue this year where there's been kind of a, an adoption of um, effective commercial rate for the UVM Health Network hospitals, and yet we've been doing uh, change in overall charges for the re the other hospitals, and we found that we've been intermingling some of those stats. We really do have to arrive at one um, measurement for change in charge in general, and we've got to stick to that. Um, the next one was capturing the impact of Medicare and Medicaid payment policies and changes. Someone had brought up, well, maybe we do this retroactively, looking back at what um, like say Medicare had given for an increase and having that backed out, that could be a component of the change in charge. You back out um, payer increases from the prior year to mitigate some of that growth. Just an idea. Those are some of the things um, that we could probably get at sooner rather than later. Um, and the price transparency matter. <clears throat> this one's probably long term. We'll get to that. But that was another one that could impact how the board looks at change in charge amongst some of its other regulatory responsibilities. The next measurement of growth with some detail to it would be, uh, or the next, sorry, common theme would be the best measurement of growth. Um, there were some, uh, uh, some ideas thrown out there about using the total cost of care per member per month in conjunction with NPR. The staff had thrown out using growth in operating expenses as conjunct in conjunction with NPR, <clears throat> as those expenses are what um, need to be covered by NPR and therefore the growth, et cetera. And um, also, we do need to work on improving comparison to other hospitals because that will help um, the board members see compared to their peers, both in-state, regionally or nationally, what type of uh, growth are we looking at? What is acceptable? So building that out, improving that and investing in some of those <clears throat> were another item that was brought up. And the last of the common themes with the details would be um, grouping the hospitals around decision-making, grouping the hospitals into critical access, prospective payment, and academic. 
understanding the cost structures of those hospitals based on their designations, there is certainly some pretty um, distinct uh, differences there in regard to those designations and to better understand some of that stuff and how it impacts those hospitals perhaps could help guide the board better in their decision making and understanding um, how fixed some of those hospitals are in regard to their expense structure. And any way that we can try to get a better handle on that, um, perhaps that would allow the board to um, pinpoint the dollars that they allocate through commercial change in charge in, in a way that's uh, more valuable to the system and specifically hospitals in those designations. Um, reducing the administrative burden by streamlining the guidance requirements and delineating need versus want. I think that came from uh, Vaz at our last meeting. And that is an important point. Um, we don't want to dilute our process by adding and adding and adding and adding things to it. So is there a way we can reduce the burden both for the Green Mountain Care Board staff and the hospitals? We did a streamlined guidance this year. Um, the hospitals uh, exhibited appreciation for that. We felt as staff, though, that some board members needed some a little bit more. So we thought we had a pretty good pre-COVID guidance going into March of last year. We then scaled that back. So perhaps within those, those confines, there is the hyper-scaled back version and then the pre-COVID version. Is there a happy point in between that we can arrive at that reduces the burden, but also gives the board members what they need to make a decision on NPR growth <clears throat> and change in charge growth. Um, and then there was the topic of the non-financial reporting that was brought up. That is usually built into the overall budget process and the deliverable is around uh, mid-May. It was thrown out there that maybe this is not the right place for it. It seems it has kind of organically grown into that process. Is there a better spot where that can fit into um, the board's regulatory oversight that may not be hospital budgets? Um, all things to be discussed. Um, and finally, clarity into why the why behind the board's decision on hospitals and ease of understanding for subject matter experts as well as the public. Um, we deal with some very complex um, matters in healthcare. And in this process, there's probably a limit to how dialed back it can get, but there's always room for improvement and there's always room for us to explore how we can improve. So those are the three common themes. And those are the three common themes with some of the feedback shared by the stakeholders that were put under those buckets. <clears throat> now we'll move into each one of those for both a short-term and long-term consideration. So I won't repeat everything I've just gone over, but you can see up on the screen here on slide seven that under the short-term considerations for the change in charge bucket, more specific guidance around the components. That's something we feel we can get at pretty quickly and the board can impact uh, directly the COVID component and standardizing the, me the measurement of change in charge, whether gross or commercial effective rate or whatever, and then capturing those Medicare and Medicaid payment policies. That seems like something that's within the grasp of the Green Mountain Care Board and board members and staff directly. There wouldn't have to be too much outside involvement there to get that done besides maybe some um, some back and forth with some of the hospitals to make sure that we are capturing exactly what we want to capture. Um, <clears throat> change in charge long-term, the price transparency discussion, um, it's due to come around on, or take effect, I should say, on January 1st of 2021. That is less than a month away. Um, we feel this is long-term because this is going to be something that has never been done in healthcare before. There's gonna be a lot of ripple effects following this, a lot of uncertainty following this. There's also the impact that there's a new administration taking office on the 20th of January, who may see things differently. So to bide our time, follow some of the, the news coming out as this thing perhaps drops on January 1st um, and kind of studying it as it goes along. And then maybe a year from now or so, if it seems like it's going to stay, then we can begin to dig into that because price transparency could impact not just this process, but also your regulatory oversight on insurance rates. So <clears throat> there would be a couple of teams on the Green Mountain Care Board side that would have to be looking into it, and even maybe some outside parties. But we feel that that is a long-term item that warrants um, some diligence, but also let's see what happens as far as the, the impact on the industry as a whole. 
Um, Short-term best measurement of growth, <clears throat> um, improving hospital benchmarks, that's something we can begin to put research into now. We are statutory obligated to have um, some quality, um, by quality, I mean good financial benchmarks um, for peers, uh, and then exploring the use of total cost of care per member per month and exploring the growth of operating expenses in conjunction with NPR as options for bolstering that measurement of growth that we currently have as only NPR. It would probably take some time for us to work that through. So the long-term considerations have that built in as well, using total cost of care as opposed to short-term exploration and using growth of operating expenses as opposed to exploring that item at first. So that kind of um, crosses both of those long-term and short-term considerations from our perspective. <clears throat> uh, the transparency and decision-making. Um, Short-term, we feel that we could group the hospitals into these um, prospective buckets based on designations and begin to work with those hospitals to understand what are the constraints you're under because of those designations and how much of your cost is fixed and where do you have the ability to um, make sure you're as efficient and as efficient as possible and where do you do not? That's a very real thing in healthcare is efficiency is a very tricky thing to put your thumb on, but we wanna make sure if we're saying, no, you look like your cost structure is growing a little too much that we actually have something to, to back that up with. Um, and reducing the administrative burden by streamlining guidance. That's a pretty quick thing to do. We did it um, very quickly this past year and turning that around. We have a precedent for it now. We also have a work product that we can say, okay, that was really dialed back. Let's build a little bit more into it by getting feedback on the board from the board members of what you absolutely need to see in this to make your decision and going from there. And that's something we could turn around pretty quickly. <clears throat> uh, Long-term considerations on transparency, the clarity into why behind the board's budget decisions. Really everything we've talked about above should trickle down into this if the board decides to take action on some or all of those. It should help improve the why behind that. That's the idea. So this is long-term because depending on what the board decides to adopt when and how, it should help better inform as we make those adjustments to the process. So this isn't so much um, a work product as it is a culmination of the other work products that we would um, take under our wings in the coming months or years or however long it takes us to make some of these uh, alterations. <clears throat> so as discussed earlier, we then took all of that and we tried to peg it on a scale of importance and difficulty. What do we feel is higher importance and lower difficulty all the way, all the way around the wheel to lower importance and lower difficulty. So trying to provide the board members with some insight around what do we think we can tackle now? And we'd like feedback from the board on whether or not you agree with some of this stuff or whether or not some of this may have to be moved, but trying to provide some sort of roadmap for um, making some of these adjustments should the board choose to adopt them. Because as the arbiters of what does and what does not occur in the guidance and the hospital budget process, we really do need board feedback on um, where to spend our resources. And we'd also advise that maybe the board could also not, we could have board members nominate themselves or other board members to help work on some of these products and be that proxy for their fellow board members as kind of the subject matter experts as we work through this and also be engaged in um, helping make these uh, changes and potential opportunities come to fruition. Um, lastly, as I discussed, there are some other comments that were made that we feel are very important to this process. Um, it may take some time to get some of these done. Others may happen. There wasn't explicitly a common ground amongst this. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but one of those was reconciling the hospital rates, the rate review process. There's a lot that goes that would go in behind that. I think to some extent it's been explored before from what I understand, but there's been some legal hurdles and that may change um, in the future, but it's something we feel we should keep on the front of our mind uh, moving forward, especially if price transparency does stick. Another one I think was brought by the HCA was addressing racial disparity in the process. Uh, this is certainly something that's probably long overdue, to be honest. And even though we're not the most diverse state, it still warrants understanding what our healthcare organizations are doing to make sure that healthcare is being delivered in a way that promotes equality 
and that all persons, regardless of any identifiers, are, are certainly being cared for in the way that any of us would hope to be cared for. So we think that certainly warrants continuation um, through this process. And then <clears throat> kind of a broader thing was we, we all get dialed into our, our perspectives here and our certain um, trenches sometimes, but I think it was Kevin to take a step back and look at the bigger picture here. And we're all working in this thing to make sure that Vermonters have access to high quality health care at the most affordable rate possible. So kind of keeping that in mind as we go through this and we, you know, we all share our different perspectives and everything that the that's the big picture here. We're all, you know, all these stakeholders are care about that right there um, on either side, any side of this equation. So that we felt was something that um, deserves some reinforcing. Um, as we even work through this process. So that's why we put that in there. Um, and with that, <clears throat> that concludes our presentation. It's quick, it's pretty high level, but we hope we captured the thoughts of all the different parties involved and uh, um, help provide the board with a little bit of guidance here for the discussion that's in front of us now. So Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Patrick. I'll kick it off on behalf of the board and just say that for me, there are two things that really jump out to the front of the list on what I think we should be focusing our initial uh, time and resources on. And that is um, having a common um, measurement for charges. And um, it should be across all hospitals. And so that's number one in my view. And number two, is to expand the guidance so that um, we give specific guidance on, um, for example, change in charges. And I say that because what we've seen is um, a repeated um, effort by um, a number of the uh, regulated entities to back into that based on um, putting together a budget and then figuring out what increase is needed to meet that budget. And I think more emphasis is placed on backing into that number than being placed on what is affordable for Vermonters and how do we adjust expenses to make it affordable for Vermonters. And so I really think those are my two highest priorities. And with that, I'll open it up to any uh, board members for their thoughts. Who would like to go first? Well, I have a couple <clears throat> that um, rise rise to mind readily. Um, you know, Patrick said that you know maybe in the budget process we should make an allowance for the cost shift, and I that's not something I would agree to. The uh, that would be like enabling the cost shift, and and to me, the cost shift is uh, a structural problem valued at hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's uh, possibly a kind of a parasite on health care reform. Assuming that our, our health care reform efforts are um, successful and we are finding efficiencies, um, improving pop population health, et cetera, um, through the back door, the cost shift kind of siphons money um, out of the system and sends it uh, elsewhere in government. And so, you know, for me, it would be. Um, a better course to admit that the cost shift is not a good thing. It is not a good thing for a certain population not to pay. Not uh, some cost shift is fine, but um, it it's it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And um, so, and there are places that we could intervene, or maybe Boz could intervene. And one suggested I would have would be at the emergency board um, every year. At the beginning of the legislative session, the emergency board, which is comprised of the governor and uh, the heads of uh, House Appropriations and Senate Appropriations and House Ways and Means and Senate Finance, they go into a very detailed presentation with the JFO on the Medicaid budget. And I think, you know, if we could find some kind of access into that system to say, you know, let's be specific and clear and straightforward about the cost shift um, so that we know how that is affecting, you know, the systems that, that we deal with. Um, as we learned in rate review from the Blue Cross Blue Shield actuary, if there was no cost shift, um, insurance premiums could be lowered by 35%. So that's, that's one area I would want to make more transparent 
and to be more aggressive on because uh, it is such a large force uh, in our hospital budget uh, system. As we saw during the hearings, every single hospital complains about the cost shift, but the can keeps get, getting kicked down the road. Uh, we keep whistling past, past the graveyard in that regard. And I think that at some point we've got to raise it to a high priority. The other area for me is fixed prospective payments. If you look at the um, 2019 hospital budget, actual fixed prospective payments as revenue, it was about 10.2% uh, of total um, NPR FFP. For the 2020 budget, which is kind of by the boards given, given the COVID problem, um, it, it was at 14.5%. And for 2021 budget, it came in at 13.9%. And I'm not sure how those percentages equate to the leveraging of the reforms that we want to occur. Um, is a 13.9% FPP uh, across hospitals a, a metric that is going to leverage the capitation that we're looking for that will generate innovation and efficiencies and allow us to reinvest in population health? So that's one metric that I would look to see whether or not, um, um, not just to kind of follow the number, but to work to establish a target, um, you know, that, that we know that we're working for. Maybe that target is 30%, maybe it's 45%. I don't know, but I think that we need to spend some time to figure out what the target needs to be for FTP across hospitals such that we can leverage uh, it has the decapitation and leveraging effect of getting our healthcare reform efforts um, where, where we'd like them to be in the next two or three years. So those are two that jump out at me. Other board members. I'll go. Um, Patrick and team, first of all, thank you for, for that presentation and pulling together all these thoughts and all these conversations that we've had. I feel like some of these uh, components of the presentation were also part of conversations we've had even last year. So you've really pulled in a lot. And I agree with all of the short-term initiatives um, that you've put forth to improve our um, you know, decision-making process and provide us with better data to be able to be better informed as we're making those decisions. Uh, I agree with Kevin in the sense that we really need to standardize the effective commercial rate so that really we're looking at apples to apples across hospitals. Um, and that's really a top priority for me. And also the second component and really understanding the changes in those effective commercial rates. So your point about inflation is important. I want to really be able to unpack what is underneath that commercial rate change. So is it inflation driving it? Is it is it cost shift? I guess I'm going to guess it's both and margins, right? So how do we start to unpack what's under the hood there and understand what is driving those commercial rate increases? What are the components? I think that's really important. If we are going to put guardrails around commercial rate or effective commercial rate, was which I hope that we're really looking at as an effective commercial rate versus just changes in the charge master, which we know are not really uh, a true, you know, showing the true impact of those commercial rate changes. We really want to look at effective commercial rate. How is that changing at the hospital level? Um, I think we need an understanding of the base price. And so where hospitals are now in their pricing. And so then we can really understand what are we building on top of that. So I, one of my questions to you, Patrick, was um, the price transparency. Uh, you had bucketed that in low importance, high difficulty. And I'm just wondering, I, I would have thought it would be high importance, lower difficulty, given that the hospitals are going to be required to report their prices in January. So the data is, is, is going to be available. It's just a question of unpacking that data um, and analyzing that data, but we've never had access to that data before. So that's where, it, to me, it moves from, you know, high difficulty to low difficulty simply because of the reporting requirements. So um, maybe you, I'll I'll finish up and then maybe you can just answer that question if you have a, a, an answer for that. Um, the benchmarks, I think, are really important. I think we need to factor in, when we're looking at each hospital, factoring in the size and the type of the hospital. 
and comparing our hospitals and how they're performing outside the state, right? At, at similarly sized and similarly uh, designated hospitals, I think is really important. I like the idea of looking at per member per month growth rates, per member per month total cost of care growth rates as a measure of hospital performance. Um, it factors in migrations, factors in you know the patient flows that we're seeing across HSA boundaries, and it, it fundamentally is looking at the total cost of care, which is what we uh, are held accountable for with the federal government. So it's it's another look at that really important component, but it also does. It's important because it's per capita, so it is recognizing that some hospital service areas are seeing out migration and some are seeing in migration. So as soon as you make it per capita, you're accounting for that, which I think is really important. And again, reducing the burden wherever we can, I think is is key, ensuring that we have the data that we need, but where we can pull in data that's already being reported in other venues um, and using that data, uh, I think would be really helpful. So. Those are some of my thoughts. I thank you for the presentation and I thank you for thinking about this and I'm excited about moving forward and, and improving our hospital budget process. But again, I, I would question, I wanna ask you a little bit about that price transparency, difficulty and um, importance piece. Yeah, so the reason that we put it down there was there's still, even though it is set for January 1st, um, at least on our end, because we've never seen it before, we don't know what we're looking at. And it's going to take a lot of time to digest and understand what we're looking at and develop a strategy as to how we're going to use that. And we did not see that dropping on January 1st and being a reality for the upcoming budget cycle. And okay. there's also the fact that because it hasn't been viewed before, there's going to be a lot of upheaval that goes into the wake of that coming out. And to, to make sure we're knowledgeable and understanding of what we're looking at to incorporate it into your decision making and make a well-informed decision it's on the lower importance higher difficulty piece because of that it doesn't seem like something that we would be able to achieve with confidence and competence going into the next hospital budget cycle so that's why it's on the higher difficulty lower importance scale right now that could change several months from now once we understand what we're looking at and and what this means and um, what it could mean for other hospitals in our region as well. I mean, we're certainly going to want to compare UVM with probably Albany and Dartmouth and things like that. So once we see what they're charging, we're going to have to dig into that and develop a strategy. Do we want to focus on all of these different charges that they're putting out there? Or are there, are there, is there a markup that we're looking at, like a grouping that we'd want to look at and say, okay, well, this is where they make their biggest markup how much do we want to really allow for them? So there's a lot out there that we've never seen and don't know yet. So that's why it's down where it is right now. Doesn't okay. mean it's not of importance, but it's it's just down on that scale from the staff's perspective. Okay. Uh, and let me just ask a quick follow-up question that I realized about the um, non-financial reporting. You had mentioned moving that around, um, some thinking differently about the non-financial reporting. Can you just elaborate a little bit about what you mean by a... Is there a better time? Is there a better way to do it? What were you thinking there? I really don't have any thoughts. I've never heard anyone on the hospital side say that is a burden. It was brought up by one of the board members in our last meeting. So that seemed to fit into that uh, more detailed bucket of, is there any way we can, through the budget process, eliminate some of the administrative burden on them developing and reporting a budget to us? So. I'm not sure from what I understand, as I said, it's kind of, it kind of ended up there. And so it probably warrants us looking at, well, is that the right place for it? Does, does it really inform the budget process around rate and NPR? If it doesn't, perhaps there's a, a different time during the year, which we can request that. But again, I've never heard any of the hospitals mention that that's a, that's an issue for them. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Thanks, Jess. Robin? Thank you. Um, I agree with what folks have said around uh, spending some time and proving the change in charge data information and guidance. Um, I do think that that's an area where we can add transparency to both the process and our decision making. Um, and obviously,
So, Robin, we may be having a problem uh, receiving uh, your signal. Perhaps you could turn off your video, and then we might be able to hear you on audio. Okay, can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I'm having all sorts of technical difficulties. My laptop died, so I'm trying to do this on the phone. Um, so, so sorry about that. Um, so what I was saying was that um, I agree with what folks have been talking about in terms of change in charge and the importance of um, that part of the process and improving the data and information that we have available, um, given that it is a lever um, connected to rate review and affordability. Um, and I, I think that it makes sense to um, continue to look at areas in the process where data and information that we're perhaps not using. Um, for me, the non-financial reporting is important. It is, I don't know how to look at the financial aspects without some concept of um, the totality of what the hospital is doing, including around quality. Um, and so that is something which I routinely have used and missed this past year. We did move that reporting to the spring. And um, I think a lot of it, quite frankly, is compiled by our staff, which is why it may not be perceived as a burden. So um, all for looking at that, but do think we need to, in some way, continue to try to incorporate quality. Um, as well as access measures, which are, I think are sort of the point of those. Um, yeah, and I think otherwise the short-term initiatives did make sense to me um, as a place to start. Um, I would just make note of a couple things in terms of the total cost of care per member per month. Um, that's something which Sarah Lindbergh has looked at uh, a couple of different times, I think, and there are challenges with doing that, which um, we have been exploring in the regulatory integration. So um, I would encourage our staff to connect with each other on that piece. And also specifically on the rate review and hospital budget component, there is a section of that in the regulatory integration paper that I would encourage people to read. Um, so that's... Uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Robin. Um, next, we'll move to Maureen. Um, thanks, and thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, I had. I want to go on the same line as as Jess was going on on the price transparency, and um, you know, looking at that chart, I also thought that should be higher importance. Um, even now, I mean, we we may not have the requirements that they have to file by January, but the hospitals themselves know what their prices are. Um, we just haven't always had the transparency of, of getting the information on prices for services. So I, I do think that's important. And where that kind of piggybacks on is to the change in charge, because one of the things we, we know is that all the hospitals aren't starting at the same starting place. And you know, we when we treat everyone the same and say we're going to have a uniform change in charge, um, that that's where I have a little bit of a hesitation. I do think we should give guidance on change in charge. Uh, the the concern is that those that may be already at higher cost um, are going to continue to grow at that higher cost, and those that that have been lower cost and more efficient, um, you know, may have more challenges living within those means. So there, there's just an issue there on, you know, how do we work that? And part of it is we don't really know the starting place and we try to treat everyone all the same, which which is a challenge. All the 14 hospitals are not the same. So if we were to come out with a change in charge, um, you know, as a uniform one rate, that might be a challenge, but, but there may be ways we can come up with some guidance there. Um, you know, a couple one of the a couple other things that maybe are more in for the long term, which we didn't really talk about, would be the sustainability plan and how that impacts um, the hospital budget process. And 
in particular when we talk about talk about services because um, hospitals may be making a small margin or no margin and um, part of that may be related to the mix of services that are being provided and are they the right mix of services in all the hospitals um, and that brings me to another thing on the chart you had where where you had positioned um, the ability for, um, I think, can you flip to that chart? Because there are a few things on that chart. I think that was a good, good way to look at it. Um, but when we talk about higher importance, lower difficulty, understanding the cost structures of the hospitals, I challenge that that's lower difficulty and and the reason why is when we look at it on a on a total perspective yes we can understand kind of you know what the cost structures are of the hospitals but really being able to dig in and understand if we were to look at where they make margin where they don't make margin by payer type by services and things like that i mean that's the way you would look at a business, right? To determine maybe where some changes could be made. Obviously, we can't just look at hospitals and say, okay, this is a business like that, and we cut those things out. But, but there may be some learnings from that um, to be able to make hospitals uh, have the ability to be more efficient. So I, I think that um, you know, it's at what level of understanding cost structures of hospitals. So I, I think that's higher importance, higher difficulty, because because from what I've seen, we we don't really have an understanding of the cost structure of, of hospitals. And when we try to dig into it, we don't get clear answers about um, about that. You know, when we talk about you know cost savings and things like um, how do we gain efficiencies and cost savings. You know that that's really one of the key drivers here to ultimately what the top line will be needs to be in order to create a margin. So so I think we need to do. Um, I would move that to a different spot. Um, and you know I think the other thing which we didn't completely touch upon. Tom talked about a little bit in fixed perspective payment, but you know just. ACO participation and as we move more into that and that becomes a larger piece of the pie, how does that then relate to change in charge and things like that? So, um, you know, I think uh, I think this has been helpful and it'll be interesting to hear, you know, some of the public comments, um, you know, that we get at this point. Thanks. Okay, anything else from the board? Any questions from staff to the board before I open it up to public comment? No, not on my end, and I'll open that up to Kate and Lori if they have anything. Hearing I guess none, we're good. <laughs> I'll open it up to uh, public comment now. Does any member of the public wish to comment? Hi, Kevin. This is Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. Hey, Mark. Go ahead. Okay, so, um, you know, just a couple things. Um, uh, I had shared this with Patrick, but, you know, the University of Vermont Health Network has been fairly s silent through the last few discussions. And I just wanted to share that we're focusing our priority in other areas right now, you know, given what we're dealing with. So I just wanted to share that out there. And then I was taking some notes as I was listening to the conversation. I think these are more items just to be aware of. Uh, well, from my perspective that I just wanted to share. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought Patrick's summary was a very good summary. I, I should say Patrick and the staff summary was a very good summary, but um, uh, and so I will just punch down to this list. It's in no particular order. I was kind of making notes as as they came to me, but <coughs> I think I think when we focus on growth rates, we really need to focus on industry standards and comparisons. They need to be fair um, uh, and they need to be specific to our industry. You know, I, I think in the past what we've heard, we know we should try to keep it uh, healthcare growth below GDP. You know, 
that's not a comparable industry standard because you show me how many other states have been able to do that. So I think we need to be very clear on, you know, what we would like to get closer to and what's a reasonable expectations. And, you know, the focus needs to be on industry standards and, you know, fair compare groups. I think as we think about the cost shift, the cost shift is real. It is impacting the hospitals considerably. Um, and the burden is growing more and more where it has a material impact on the hospital's financial results each year. So, you know, we can talk about the individual components of that, but I just don't know how the cost shift can't be part of the conversation given the significant impact on the hospitals. Um, as we think about affordability, um, I think that we just need to remind ourselves that the hospital process is just one part of the cost structure that all of the Vermonters are engaging in. So, you know, the more we can transition to total cost of care and those relationships, I think that's a better place to be. Um, and, you know, this kind of gets back to the cost shift uh, uh, component, but, you know, we need to remember that when a patient comes to any healthcare provider, they don't think about the cost shift. They don't think about the problem. What the, what the profitability of that service may or may not be. They focus on what is the best, best care that that patient needs to get them healthy again. And so the providers are bearing the cost of that care up front, even before any payment is processed. So, you know, I think that we just need to remember that of, of you know, just saying, that and you know this gets back to the cost shift conversation is you know just saying that that you know that needs to be a focus here because you know with the providers that are providing the care they don't think about it that way and you know um if the providers start to think about that way i worry about the downstream impacts that that it could have um on our healthcare system um there was no conversation about understanding other revenue. I think we've had some conversations in the past, and I think it, I think that it, you know, was said the hospitals wouldn't have a margin if it wasn't for 340B. So we know, um, um, I think a better understanding of other revenue and the relationship of everything else um, uh, um, needs to be. There just needs to be more emphasis on that than there has been in the past. I think it makes sense to do the crosswalk on the commercial charge. You know, we'll to talk to all of the areas that are driving that. So that makes sense. Um, you know, what we didn't talk about at all, or, you know, what I didn't hear and understanding what the components of the math might lead into this, but you know, what is an appropriate margin, you know, Hospitals need to have a margin to, con to continue to invest to meet the needs of the patients. And, you know, as you just think about the hospitals and the margin and the deterioration of those margins and the number of hospitals that are growing that are in the red, I do think there needs to be some aspect of that injected into the process. Um, let me see. I'm trying to understand this note, Kevin. So, um, so... <laughs> Yeah. Um, so as it relates to inpatient and many outpatient services, we need to remind ourselves that the healthcare system is complicated and it is complicated, but the hospitals and other providers for inpatient services and many, many outpatient services are not paid at the line item level. So that complicates things as we, I mean, they're simply not paid that way. The inpatient is DRG. Outpatient, many of the services are on episodes of care now. Uh, um, uh, so, you know, um, I think that we need to find ways to do a better job than we're doing today, candidly. But, you know, you know that piece of this is going to be an evolution. And, you know, as we think about the impacts um, of the decisions that we make, and when I say the decisions that we make is it could be the Green Mountain Care Board decisions, it could be decisions that individual hospitals choose to make, but we really need to break that down into what that does to access, what that does to cost, what that does co to commercial rates. Because, you know, if say a hospital stops doing 
a critical service, but another provider is going to continue that critical service that isn't the isn't under the regulatory oversight of the Green Mountain Care Board. You know, while it might appear that the hospital has lowered cost, it really hasn't lowered the cost of care. And you know, at what cost any decisions impact on access? So you know, I I, I think. You know, there's a lot of difficult decisions to come. This is not an easy process. Well, the board's role is not an easy role in the process. But, you know, um, I believe that we're coming to a breaking point where decisions are going to be made on cutting costs, which is going to have a direct correlation on access. And we just need to keep that conversation open so everyone fully understands the impacts of those decisions. And um, uh, I thank you for this time and opportunity to share those thoughts. Thank you, Mark. It was really good uh, comments, and uh, I sympathize with you on the uh, not being able to read your notes. I have the same problem. I don't know where my penmanship went south, but <laughs> now it's uh, like deciphering whatever I wrote. So uh, with that, I'm going to go to Mike Del Treco, and the um, next on deck will be Mike Fisher. Uh, thanks, uh, Chairman, uh, Chairman uh, Mullen. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have as many words as Mark, I, I never do. Um, so uh, just to be brief, um, I think uh, Patrick, the outline uh, that you put together and the um, the efficiency of the conversation that just took place is, is um, really important in this time. So um, I wanna comment on a couple of things that I think the change in charge is critically important. I think the board, our members, um, really need to be careful not to portray that we have multiple charge structures. Um, often when we talk about change in charge and we have a commercial rate, um, that's really not true. We have one rate and they have different effects on how payments work. Um, I know you're having a reimbursement uh, discussion next week and there'll be a lot of information shared there. So we just need to be cognizant of uh, potential um, odd compliance issues where public hears this and they think they might have a different charge than some other uh, individual with a different um, that with a different commercial uh, with a different insurance carrier. Um, secondly, I think uh, transparency, I've heard a couple or times not during not just this meeting, but the prior meeting, and, and I think uh, from my perspective, things are very transparent um, uh, and, and it's maybe things that are missing elements. And I would like to sort of move into exacting what those missing elements are. And if they're available, what can we produce them? Uh, and, and if they're available, that's one thing. And if they're, if it's thought to be available and there's difficulty and there's reasons why they can't produce, we need to recognize those those as well. And um, and then finally, I think um, a streamlined uh, budget guidance, or, or with that always in mind, whether it's during this time of pandemic or not, I think is important. Um, making sure that all parties and entities get what they need to make uh, the, the decisions must must be part of that equation too. So those are the three areas of comment that I have and certainly happy to talk to anybody and Patrick more in detail, but, but, but thanks for the efficiency of the conversation and uh, the clarity. Mike, can I just ask you a follow-up question to what you said? Sure can. So you said that uh, people shouldn't uh, think that there's um, different charges on commercial <laughs> rates, but if, one insurer is reimbursing a hospital at 80% of charges and another one is reimbursing a hospital at 75% of charges. Isn't that really a difference in charge? Um, actually, you, you answered your the question. It's a reimbursement. The payment is different. The charge to charge to the patient and payer, um, payer is the same. And then what impacts that charge is the insurance program that you might be enrolled in as an individual, and then the contractual relationship that that insurance carrier has with any one provider. So the charge is the same. Those two elements make um, either out-of-pocket change or um, the payment to the provider change. So whether you're Medicare, Medicaid, commercial, self-pay, um, 
if you and I had the identical service at the identical location and I was Medicaid um, and you were self-pay, we would get, or, or commercial, we would get the same identical charge. And the payment for that service and the out-of-pocket for that service would change depending on um, uh, the product that you're enrolled in and the contractual arrangement that the provider has with the insurer. Thanks, Mike. Um, next, Mike Fisher. Um, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, and thank you, board staff. I, uh, I will echo what's been said. I think that was a, a great presentation with a lot of important questions. Um, and I also want to just echo, I think, um, well, this last conversation that was just going on, I, the, the, the question for me is a common measurement of charge um, across hospitals. Um, you know, um, is the methodology of determining charge uh, uh, done similarly across hospitals is the way I understood uh, the chair's original comment. Um, and I also want to uh, appreciate the chair's original comment around just understanding what the affordability impacts are about um, what happens when rates go up. Um, about cost shift, I just want to bring it home for a second. Um, uh, uh, the administration is developing a budget at this moment. Um, I, I would be uh, um, tremendously surprised if there was any kind of proposal to have um, Medicaid reimbursement rates uh, keep pace with inflation, let alone make up some of the lost ground. And also recognize um, the constraints that they're under, they probably can't, uh, given the global commitment caps um, that we live under. Um, but it's a decision happening right now, right in front of us, and um, um, and it's real. And then um, I, uh, under the category of other data available, I um, we've spent a little bit of time looking at the uh, Medicare cost report and um, and attempting, and it, it may be that there is uh, some information in the Medicare cost report or in the IRS 990 that is, um, is close enough to some of the data that uh, the board asks for, um, or at least on a surface level should be, um, that there may be some uh, improved efficiency that the board could ask for, um, you know, Medicare, Cost report at you know S10 line 23 column three you know in place of how much do you spend on free care and I'm going into the weeds for a second for uh, just to make the point um, I can't recommend uh, such a move because when we compare what the hospitals report um, uh, on what should be very similar measures. Um, to what they report to the Green Mountain Care Board, we we can't um, make a lot of sense about the variation uh, that we see. Um, so, my real comment is that it would take some work to understand why the numbers show up so differently. Um, but there may be some efficiencies available um, in those reports to make uh, reporting easier for the hospitals. <clears throat> and that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Is there any other member of the uh, public that wishes to offer comment? Hearing none, Patrick, is there anything else that you need um, to guide you in your efforts to uh, keep this process moving to make the necessary changes? I don't believe so at this time. We will get together as a staff here and uh, digest the discussion today and provide the board with uh, some updates on what we've heard and then probably reach out to some board members to start moving some of these initiatives forward. Super, thank you. And thank you everyone for uh, the uh, feedback this morning. And we are going to go into recess until one o'clock this afternoon. Thank you everyone.